Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 7th of July and start of Microsoft's financial year and a pretty quiet week. I've actually been on vacation this week. Me and the family went off to a little cabin in the woods. It was nice to just get away from everything. As always, I have the chapters, so you can jump to a particular update. And this week, I dived into Azure Chaos Studio. Thinking about chaos engineering as a way to inject problems into your Azure environment to simulate real world issues by actually having the effect happen to your resources. What would happen if an AZ was down? All those VMs will disappear. Network latency, high CPU stress, memory stress, um, certificates are not available, can't get to a key vault. So I can inject different types of failures through an experiment to see, hey, am I as resilient as I thought I was? So I go through exactly how to use Azure Chaos Studio. So on to what's new. On the compute side, so the Azure native New Relic service has gone GA. So the whole point of New Relic is it's a full stack observability platform. When you think about application performance, infrastructure monitoring, error tracking, real user monitoring, log management, and more. Well, now for my Azure platform, I can use this Azure native New Relic service to do that monitoring, that troubleshooting, that optimization of my Azure services, my Azure-based applications. It's available through the marketplace and it can both create and manage a New Relic account through there as well. Um, it's really easy to configure the lot logs and metrics to integrate with this, so you can get up and running pretty easily. The Azure Monitor Agent version of VM Insights is now available for the GovCloud. So remember, the Azure Monitor Agent replaced the old Log Analytics Agent, the Diagnostics Extension, the Telegraph Agent for Linux. Those all rolled into the brand new Azure Monitor Agent, which gets those centrally defined data collection rules. Well, VM Insights used to work off of the old agent, but now they've enhanced it to work through the new Azure Monitor agent. Well, now that new version is also available in GovCloud in preview. And then leading on from that, Azure Monitor Agent Health. So we now have this whole experience about, well, what is the health of that new agent? I can think about a single place to go to view the entire at scale deployment of the Azure Monitor agent. What percentage is healthy? Um, what versions am I running in terms of, hey, it's working against different types of resource, different operating systems, and of course the agent version as well. What are the state of my data collection rules? Now this is gonna work for your Azure VMs and your Azure Virtual Machine scale sets and your ARC enabled servers. So that can use the AMA as well. So it's just there to help give me a nice single view of my entire AMA estate. And then Container Insights, remember the whole point of all of these insights offering is it's a curated set of metrics, of logs, of views that the particular product group think are the most important things. Well now, even if I'm using pod sandboxing, I can still get those container insights. Remember, the whole point of pod sandboxing is it's using those CATA containers. And what that is, is it's basically a managed virtual machine. So every pod now runs in its own managed VM, which means it's basically running its own container runtime, its own kernel. So instead of regular containers are isolated, at a user mode level using things like namespaces within the operating system. When I'm using the pod sandboxing, it's putting a much harder isolation between the pods. I'm actually using the hardware in the box, the hypervisor, to go and create specific instances of the container runtime running in their own kernel to give me a much greater degree of isolation. So if I'm using that pod sandboxing, I can still leverage those container insights. On the networking side, so the App Gateway Web Application Firewall, so remember App Gateway is the regional layer seven, and I can add the Web Application Firewall regional to that, now has sensitive data protection. So what that's talking about is when I have the various WAF operating, well, it writes logs. 
So based when I get certain matching of a rule with different criteria, it captures the event and writes its web application firewall logs. Well, those logs are stored as plain text. We want that for debugging purposes, so it's easy to read and consume. I can go and look for different patterns. Well, the challenge could be, in a sensitive data scenario, if I go and look at those logs, maybe just by knowing things like the IP address, maybe even password might show, depending on how I'm injecting that in a JSON, in a header, I might be able to discern information that I shouldn't be able to discern. And so the whole point of this sensitive data protection is what it's gonna do is it's gonna have log scrubbing rules. So it's gonna be able to define rules and it's gonna be able to replace the sensitive data with just a whole bunch of wildcard characters. So it's gonna be able to scrub things like the IP address, um, request header names, cookie names, argument names, post argument names, uh, JSON argument names. All of those can be scrubbed. It will remove it from the log file. I'll just get a whole bunch of wildcards. And then Azure Virtual Network Encryption in Preview. Now ordinarily, if you have data traveling between um, different regions, even different data centers, where Microsoft doesn't maybe have absolute control over what could see the wire, they use encryption. But what this is gonna enable me to do is even between virtual machines in the same VNet, virtual machine scale sets in the same VNet, or peered regional or global VNets, it will encrypt the traffic. So it's gonna enhance any of the existing in-transit encryption capabilities. Now, it has to be a virtual machine that supports accelerated networking. Because remember, what does accelerated networking do is if I think of the FPGA, the smart NIC in the host, it exposes virtual functions and that virtual function maps to a virtual NIC in the virtual machine. Well, the encryption is being terminated at that smart NIC, at the FPGA, that's doing the encryption and the endpoint where it's decrypted. So it's not taking a toll on the host or the guest OS, it's happening in that specialized FPGA, that smart NIC. So I have to use a VM that has accelerated networking, it has to be enabled. So I'm using that virtual function that provides the virtual NIC. And that's in preview, I think you have to sign up for it right now, um, but that, that'd be an interesting option where it will add additional encryption. On the storage side, so archive storage is now available in Sweden Central in GA. Remember, archive storage is that super, super cheap. It's not available in real time. It's basically written away somewhere else. If I now want to read the data, I have to bring it back into another tier, such as call or hot or cold, which is in preview as well. But it's really, really cheap. And it's really good if I have to just keep data for a really, really long amount of time and I wanna do it as cheaply as possible. And then premium SSD V2 is available in some new regions. So if I think now it's Switzerland, North Japan, East, Korea Central, South Africa North, Sweden Central, Canada Central, and the Central US regions, I now have the premium SSD V2. Remember the V2 big deal is before, if I think as the capacity grew, so did the IOPS and the throughput, and it was fairly linear. Now there were some burst options, but I basically added performance by making it bigger. What the V2 does is it separates out capacity from the IOPS and the throughput. I think I have three dials, capacity, IOPS, throughput. And the IOPS and throughput, I can change dynamically. So I don't have to disconnect the disk. Hey, I'm running some batch job, I need more IOPS or more throughput. Hey, I can change those dials. Obviously I pay more. I pay now for the capacity, IOPS and the throughput then I can move it back down within certain time windows. So it's a lot like the Ultra Disk. Its latency is not as small as Ultra, so Ultra is still the absolute fastest, absolute lowest latency, but this is kind of next uh, on the ring. So if I need that greater flexibility, this is a really good option. And then miscellaneous, so Azure Monitor Logs, so Log Analytics Workspace, now has table level RBAC in preview. Now this is a new version of the table level role-based access control. So it's gonna work for both workspace and resource context logs, but I'm now gonna add permissions at a table sub-resource of the workspace. So I get really granular role-based access controls, and that's gonna include my cost custom log tables, which was a problem with the legacy. It didn't work well with custom log tables, but now this does. I'm essentially assigning a role to a particular table um, to get that granularity of saying, hey, I can only read these particular tables from within this workspace. And it does work side by side 
uh, with the legacy model. Managed Grafana now has managed private endpoint in preview. So the whole big deal here is that I may have data sources that don't have their public endpoint. They're only enabled through private endpoints. So if I think about things like uh, Azure Monitor Private Link Scopes, Azure Data Explorer, um, Cosmos DB, um, for MongoDB, Azure SQL Server, maybe I can only get to them through a private endpoint. So what this will let me do is the managed Grafana can now talk to the private endpoints of those data sources and it doesn't require the public endpoint. So I can keep just the private access to my data. And then now there's a direct event hub to log analytics workspace ingestion. So as in preview, and if we think about the idea of this before, if I wanted to get my data from an event hub into a log analytics workspace, I would have to most probably write some event driven function, or I could also um, use some other serverless technology. But that obviously costs me money. There's the investment I have to do to create that and then pay for those triggers and then the computational power that it needs. What this lets me do is now I can directly feed from Event Hub into my log analytics workspace. So I don't have to rely on any other kind of serverless technology. It's gonna be really scalable, really reliable. I'm not relying on something else. It's a fully managed service and there's really not much configuration to it at all. So that's available in preview as well. And that's it. So it was a pretty quick update. As always, thanks for watching. Until next video, take care.